Um, it has been, the point is for me it's been a really int um, exciting time in the last few years to have an opportunity to work with a variety of students at different universities other than my own. Um, and including today having the wonderful opportunity even briefly to step inside the Super Corridor studio here um, at Arizona, University of Arizona. And uh, this is an incredibly important time for us as we, uh, in the multidisciplinary professions of landscape architecture, that's not always with a comma in between, landscape architecture, architecture, planning, ecology, and related uh, allied professions and sister disciplines, an incredibly important time for us as we tackle ever larger problems that are sometimes wicked and complex and certainly complicated. So it really is an exceptional opportunity for us to, all of us, to be able to engage across the disciplines and at different schools, particularly those with allied professions. And I was really encouraged today to see in the studio that so many of you are working in not only interdisciplinary groups, but in transdisciplinary ways, thinking across the disciplines to tackle the problems at the scales um, that we, we face in the coming years, sometimes very projectively and very speculatively. And I want to talk about what some of those challenges are and in the context of um, opportunities that present to integrate landscape, infrastructure, and urbanism. Uh, I think nowhere else in continental North America than in the Southwest do the, you, we face some of the, the challenges as poignantly and um, explicitly as you do here. And I say that coming from a northern area with the world's most abundant supply of water, to me that's always an, an amazing thing to step here into the dry and to see where some of those challenges um, will arise. And also I think where some creative solutions are to be found, even in very poignant and beautiful little pockets like I had the opportunity to see just a few minutes ago at your own uh, Underwood Garden, turns out designed by a friend and colleague. And so really nice to see how we can look at multiple scales from the very tiny oasis-like um, moments of shelter to very large scale thinking about different biotypes and habitats that present. So thank you for the opportunity to join you. I hope that in the next 45 to 50 minutes, you'll tell me if that's too short or too long. I'll look around and see. If people start putting their headphones on and looking a little dozy, it might be time for uh, to leave quickly. So we'll, we'll adjust on the fly as necessary, but I hope that um, I can present with you some opportunities for fruitful consideration as we move towards an urbanism that must necessarily become more ecologically in the sense that uh, we want to think about how to live within our habitats as they change around us. So I'm really going to talk about a combination of factors that come together here in this lecture around landscape and infrastructure and particularly from the perspective that we've opened up um, new and exciting territories, I think, for landscape architecture in particular, because that's really the nexus where I'm uh, directing my interest between ecology and planning, but also for, again, the allied professions, where roads, bridges, sewers, storm drains, and so on were once the purview of uh, civil engineers. They're now being recognized explicitly and importantly as the territory of the design professions as well, particularly as we begin to think speculatively. And that's for a number of different reasons. Um, the first of these, I guess, these key themes that underline some of the, the projects and potential solutions that I'll point to, including the trajectories of thinking behind them, have to do with these, these themes. The first is a shift in urbanism, which we all understand, and again, you uh, poignantly in the American Southwest see that we are becoming ever more urban. Our smaller areas join, conjoin together to cr be, you know, create these very large belts like the Sun Belt, the Sun Sand Corridor um, in this area. And increasingly around the world, these global uh, metropolitan regions. At the same time, particularly in North America and in America specifically, we've seen a decline in civil in infrastructure. Civil infrastructure, much of which was created after the Second World War, and much of it which took root in the middle of the last century is now physically declining, as well as declining public expenditure around infrastructure. We need to rethink what it means to build infrastructure. We also, of course, need to rethink this in the context of how we understand infrastructure to be as our, our energy systems change. And I saw some wonderful examples of that in the studio, thinking years ahead to new modes of transportation, for example, we need to think about what it means to redefine infrastructure. We need to make it work for us in different ways. Perhaps our infrastructures become new kinds of habitat. They become multimodal and multifunctional. With this, of course, a concomitant rise in understanding about ecology. Our ideas about ecology, our research and our um, evidence around ecological living systems has changed profoundly in the last quarter century. And I'll speak specifically about one of the projects 
in which I've been engaged in that takes stock of those changes in new paradigms about ecology and what they mean for design, uh, the design arts and the design uh, sciences in particular. Coupled with this, of course, is the idea of landscape itself is undergoing a renaissance, a kind of a rebirth in understanding. In landscape architecture in, in particular, as a discipline, you've seen that change happen over the past decade, that shift um, from a really working with arch landscape architecture, not only as the medium of practice, but now becoming a medium for the city, being understood as a, a fundamental palette of the city. As our cities grow, so too the landscapes they inhabit, and that in turn creates a, a, a hybrid condition that allows us to really explore that um, fifth theme for me, which is the reintegration of culture and nature. And I say reintegration because, of course, historically all people, um, cult their cultures were derived from the nature that sustained them. And only, in, it's really a phenomenon, of course, of modernism that our societies have shifted away from understanding that which sustains us. So there is a shift towards reintegrating and hybridization, if you will, of the processes of the natural world and our cultural processes. So all of this for me, all of these five themes resonate around the idea of a different kind of an urbanism, that we're moving into an era that might be described or has been described by some as an ecological urbanism. Of course, we define this by different terms. We call it sustainability sometimes. We also call it uh, resilience thinking. And some of us just call it a new kind of urbanism. And so we can explore a little bit about what that means. Of course, we see lots of kind of caricatures about how this might manifest, this taken from my own backyard, so to speak, in the city of Toronto. This is a suburb that was built now probably 10 years ago, but at the time of its coming, it was one of the first new urbanist communities within, within um, let's just say, close to the city. And this idea that the city's perimeter was somehow closer to nature than the rest of the city was advertised here as nature and architecture in perfect harmony. Of course, we don't know what that really looks like, and the caricature that's presented to us really looks more like the park in the city. But we might examine that critically to ask, what does that really mean? What does it mean to be up close to the natural world? And how might that um, inform our city making? So of course, this isn't a new idea. There's been lots of ideas about this for, for more than a quarter century. But we might think about this a little differently in the context of infrastructure and the context of the living systems around us that are increasingly becoming designed into our infrastructure. This image comes to us from Canmore, Alberta. And for me, as a Canadian working both in the city and on the edge of the city, I'm struck by the, the, the kind of contradictions and tensions in this image that we all want there to be nature in the city, but we're not always sure which kind of nature we'd like to foster. And so this woman, as she's watching the elk during uh, what is rutting season, because that's the time you would, would see these creatures meandering around your, your suburban area, um, might not be the safest thing to do. Um, there's a little bit of a size difference between the, 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 uh, the creatures in that image. But it, it really, for me, brings out some of these tensions and contradictions about what it means to live up close to nature. So too does the presence of uh, species that might not be the most desirable for everyone. We have conversations routinely in the area of environmental and ecological planning about which species for whom, what kinds of ecologies are we looking to foster in thinking about our growing cities. So the, the, the image of the suburban coyote is, I think, omnipresent now. We've seen images in New York City design competitions with the um, you know, coyote curled up on a subway seat. Um, this is a really common meme now that we see lots and lots of these pictures. But this one for me is kind of more contemplative. The coyote really wondering where does its backyard end and the front yard begin. Not so different than some of us. So we might think about these images as conveying something about life on the edge. What is it, to what is it like to live on the edge of one culture or nature? And to think about what an integration or hybridization condition might look like. And Landscape architects, architects, planners, we think about this a lot in different um, milieux. And this particular image comes from not far away from um, the city of Toronto. This is outside the city. And you can see very clearly how we define an edge condition. In this case, the farms that eventually stop being farmed and become speculative land holdings for the next development. This is a phenomenon familiar to all of us. And perhaps not so unlike this area, although unlike it physically in many ways, we face this triple threat of increasing pressure on our resources, increasing need to accommodate a changing, growing city, uh, in particular in my community, uh, with a tremendous number of newcomers, not only to the country, but to the city, not so different than here as well, and also concomitant with that, the loss of um, our most important farmland. 
And so in my area, there's that triple threat. Also an area that is southernmost in the country where the most of our biodiversity is, is already at risk. So we have a lot of competition for our land base. And I think that sounds familiar to you probably. We also have an interesting phenomenon among all of us that we only really understand certain kinds of ideas about nature. And if you have to guess which, you know, what, what's the common theme of what you see on the screen, all of these are newcomers. They're just newcomers to their areas in a different way. So this is taken from the perspective of a North American, you might say, except for the coconut crab, which I had to put in because it's just such a dramatic picture. All of these creatures are opportunists. They're all highly adaptable. They're all ubiquitous in their area. Even the coconut crab, so I'm told. Some, someone really has to take me to task on that, but I am told. And they are um, not always liked. In fact, they're usually reviled in some way by some portion of, of, of the population. So they're all adaptable. They're all really good images of successful nature in the city, but not always from the human perspective. So it really begs the question, who's nature? What nature are we talking about when we want to think about an ecological urbanism? So these are creatures who live on the edge. They like to inhabit new niches. They take advantage of changing conditions. And it shouldn't be surprising to us that they're actually very much like us. We share that in common. We share that adaptability and that kind of niche jumping. And so in my community, again, we see signs about which kind of nature counts and which doesn't as we start thinking about what it means to reintegrate. And we see signs that tell us which species belong and which ones don't. The N with a capital N for native, those are the ones we really want to protect. And yet, of course, they're most at risk in our highly urbanized environments. They're not so easy to accommodate. And I'm not really showing you the ice unsafe picture, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> Um, but you can't help it in Toronto, particularly this winter, th those signs are always posted together, although this, the, the image clearly is not one of, um, you don't have to worry about the ice. You only have to know that you're not supposed to put your pets in the city park because we don't want them, we want to encourage other kinds of species. So what I'm emphasizing here is that ecology and the urbanizing and the rapidly urbanizing environment really becomes a question of policing who belongs and who doesn't. Which kinds of nature do we want to foster and how do we go about building an infrastructure that allows us to think about this in a way that's meaningful. And so designers, urbanists, have to mediate that space in a way that sometimes is unfamiliar. It's a new way of thinking about the city, particularly on the scale that we are. Um, this image of Alianthus and, of course, the raccoon peeping out of the rubbish bin are all kind of common signs of what it is to consider an ecology in the city, so much so that we've seen lots of effort lately um, to write and talk about these. This is a wonderful new guidebook by Peter Del Tredici, who is um, the head of the Harvard Arboretum, someone who I've had the pleasure to work with recently. And I really like that he's essentially retitled a very excellent field guide. He's telling us that this is his guide to wild urban plants. Well, in case you're wondering what wild urban plants are, they were formerly called weeds, weeds of the Northeast. Weeds are, of course, as you all know, are plants that just are plants that aren't really wanted in a place that isn't considered the right spot for them. Uh, they're a plant like anything else. They're just highly opportunistic and they tend to spread very quickly. So urban plants follow that same logic. And Peter's done a wonderful job, I think, of finding niches for these plants and wondering, is there a role for them? And what might their role be, particularly at a different scale than we've thought about them before? And so I'd like to emphasize in the next few minutes that there are a whole series of works recently that I think will knit this trajectory together rather nicely, that really begin to talk about the city as a landscape. And in fact, um, the work by Charles Waldheim in the early part of this decade, the landscape urbanism re reader, was one of the first to contemplate from a design and planning perspective, the landscape, the contemporary city as a landscape rather. So landscape urbanism in this context was about seeing and understanding landscape through the city lens in terms of its processes and its flows. Um, what I think of as not only the form of the city and its architectural uh, um, context, but rather the function and the flows and the field of the city as a landscape. So this is a relatively recent phenomenon to think of the city beyond its architecture and not just as a patchwork of parks. Then, of course, we come to this work on ecological urbanism, also a, a project of Harvard faculty and, and colleagues 
And the, really, this is the coming together of the many different kinds and ways of thinking about the city as, as landscape, beyond just uh, landscape as a palette, but the ecological flows across the city, a different lens for thinking about urbanism. So all of this points to a changing idea about urbanism that in turn will allow us to rethink our infrastructure. In the, the um, summer, or the spring rather, of 2010, uh, Harvard, where I was, have been working for the last four years as visiting <coughs> professor, put together a colloquium under the direction of Chris Reed, my co-author, um, entitled Critical Ecologies, that really looked at inspiration f um, from the ecological sciences and beyond, thinking critically about ecology as social metaphor and cultural force um, as um, giving shape to the design arts and where the design arts were going with this. And so I think um, this has led to our work called Projective Ecologies, uh, which is out in a few weeks, that really takes stock of contemporary ideas in ecology and asks what design is making of these, uh, these perspectives on ecology. Ecology is plural, not just contemporary ecological science, but several other ways of thinking about ecology. And so we also took some inspiration from an article by Andrew Blum in places, and now a few years old, where he really looked at ecology as a metaphor, a metaphor for healing, remedi remediation of the city, a new way of thinking about the city form. And again, this is not new, but it's contemporary way of thinking about ecology, in particular, a new set of ecologies. And I, I was particularly interest, interested in infrastructure. I'm interested in how we can make infrastructure work for us in a more productive, multifunctional way, particularly at a time when we have limited resources and where we see it, um, its effects around us every day declining. And so I think if we look at infrastructure through the lens of ecology, we see multiple opportunities uh, for thinking about urbanism very differently. This is an image of um, the major river that flows through the city of Toronto. Un unlike the rivers here, it actually does have water in it. Um, not moving very quickly, and it's unlike, or it's, it's like many other urban rivers in that it drains a very large watershed area of several hundred uh, square, square miles, almost 400 square kilometers, and it um, finds its heart right through the downtown core of the city where it's channelized for the convenience of serving the grid of transportation channelized in the turn of the last century. And of course its purpose was to, uh, for transit and of course for, for safety and flood protection at the time was called flood control, but we now realize that it's really more about flood amelioration, flood management. And in 2005, um, that should say five, not six, um, the base of it looked like this. It still does look like this for the most part, where the flow has been really reduced and at the spring melt, a lot of the junk that washes off the surface of the city comes to a very ungainly and rather depressing looking nexus. In fact, this is the place where this very large, rather majestic, the largest urban watershed in, in, in my country, um, meets one of the Great Lakes. And this is not really typically how you think of a, a river meeting the lake. Uh, it doesn't usually look like that buried under this tangle of transportation infrastructure, but it's pretty common throughout North America. And a funny thing happened um, in 2005. August of 2005, if you can remember, that was Hurricane Katrina, that when it moved up the northeast coast, it became a tropical storm. And when it hit Toronto, dumping a record amount of rainfall in one day, um, my students and I were actually preparing for a, an end of summer, beginning of fall studio, and we just happened to take shelter from the rain. And in the space of 90 seconds, we watched this viaduct wash out. And that alone is not really a surprising thing to happen in a major storm event, a 50-year storm. Um, this happens a lot. But what was interesting to me about this series of images taken so close together um, is that it happened extremely quickly without any warning, and it was an immediate sign of how our infrastructure, our civil engineering infrastructure, had met, met, met its match, its lifespan. You could say that it, its time was up, but you could also say something else, and that is that the blue infrastructure underneath the gray infrastructure was always there. The river that we thought we'd buried and gotten rid of still there and still very active. And when that river flows, even if you can't see it, of course it moves. And so there was a reminder that the infrastructure um, of the everyday on the surface is perhaps ephemeral and temporary, but the infrastructure that carries with it the important um, force of water is always there. At least in this particular place, it's still there, even when we think we've uh, shaped it. So if there's a way that we can find to stack our infrastructures more creatively, 
in a way that makes them both more resilient, maybe we can move forward, rather than just rebuilding this and redesigning the bridge. That can be done too, but we don't have a lot of money. We're always looking for ways to do these things more efficiently. And it's really clear in this particular instance that we have to find some other way of dealing with infrastructure. And so we begin to look to ecology as an analog for thinking about uh, design and infrastructure in this context. And the reason that I take this stance is to suggest that it's time to move beyond the metaphor of ecology, but think a little bit about ecological services, for one thing. That's a common way of phrasing the functions of the ecological world around us. They're not really there just to serve us. That's a pretty much a human perception. But on the other hand, they provide a very vital service that's undervalued and not always priced, that's for sure. But they're also a medium of practice. For landscape architects, there's no getting around the fact that the ecological functions of the world are actually a medium in which you practice. They're the bricks and mortar, so to speak, of the profession. Um, we can also think about how to mimic natural systems, which are highly efficient and also um, eminently sustainable. They usually continue. Uh, and they're usually open systems, so there are ways to think about what that means for design. And in that context, as models for infrastructure, how can we think about using ecological functions as, if not a model for infrastructure and a metaphor, but also a medium? And if we think about the definition of ecology, we have to be a little broader than just the science of living things. Most um, definitions offer you at least three or four different ways of thinking about the living world. Traditionally, we're talking about the relationship between the physical environment and living system, living organisms. But we can also think about the many branches of ecology and what that might offer us as designers. So I'd like to encourage us to think about ecologies and design as more than just a metaphor, more than just a medium. But all of these ideas, they are motif as much as they are um, motive for doing things. And so there are multiple plural types of ecologies that we can harness and inform our practice with, I suggest. And in fact, there are lots of examples of how that's being done. Um, this is an aerial view looking south along that river. I showed you the river actually flows through this image in the city of Toronto. This is the sort of geographic center and one of the large ravine systems that define the city in terms of its green infrastructure. So I think of the city as having this skeletal system of green infrastructure and a system of arterial circulation, if you will. The veins of the city and the arteries of the city are blue. They're, they're water. So water and um, living vegetation, these are part of the fundamental fabric of that landscape. And so we can look a little bit at this kind of an image to think about other ways to perceive infrastructure. The civil engineering infrastructure is very clearly in this image, by the way. It's not that I overlook it or that it's not present. In fact, it runs right through this image. So if I can make my little pen work with any degree of precision, which I can't seem to do, what I can do is say that um, the, the highway to the left of the image, the expressway, is one major piece of gray or civil engineering infrastructure. There's also uh, an oil pipeline. There's a rail line, if, if you look carefully, you can also see it along the left-hand side. There is a natural gas pipeline, so oil, gas, railway, uh, and then a city expressway, as well as bicycle routes all through this green corridor and pedestrian routes. So there are multiple networks of infrastructure that define any city, and this image is just one that's maybe helpful for thinking about multiple categories of infrastructure. We can also think about green and blue uh, infrastructures um, as design strategies for repurposing and adapting some of our older infrastructures. The one image on the left hand side is a speculative image by Jackie Bruckner as a set of green screens to trap and hold enormous volumes of storm water that continuously run off our elevated expressway, an expressway that is crumbling and that at this moment is being reconsidered for uh, alternate uh, scenarios. One is uh, removal, one is do nothing but prop up, and then the other interim strategies are gradually bringing it down to grade and or burying it. And we've seen that strategy everywhere from Boston to Seattle at present um, and many other places. So again, this is not unique to the city in which I work and live, but rather illustrative of challenges that we are all facing, as well as opportunities. How can we use these structures to do something else for us. In this case, deal with stormwater. We can think of lots of examples um, on the right-hand side of the screen from treatment systems, overland stormwater treatment systems, the case here of one of our parks that was recently just finished um, on the waterfront that deals with overland stormwater in a series of what you all are familiar with, bioswales and standing terraced wetlands that treat um, water from the nearby buildings and, of course, also treat um, 
pet waste. E. coli is a factor for us in almost all of our city parks. There's, our urban dogs are everywhere. So when we talk about bringing nature into the city, we have urban dogs everywhere. We have urban cats everywhere. And so we need to treat waste at surface that isn't just from um, the kinds of things you might normally expect. So biological waste is also part of that treatment. An example from Malmö, Sweden, also doing the same type of thing, threading its way all through the um, Western Harbor to be discharged into the, into the sea. So these images are just are actually very common at this point, but reminders that we can think at multiple scales of infrastructure in terms of their water treatment, in terms of their functionality, as well as in terms of their public amenity value. And I think you're, again, the elegant little oasis garden you have here, um, or across the street rather at Kapla, the Underwood Garden is a, is a wonderful example of just that. But it, of course, provides a gathering place for people as well. So we can also think about them as buffering and maintaining. This case on, on the Vancouver Skytrain is a series of terraced, a terracing in the Skytrain to prevent erosion and of course make the, the, the environment perhaps more pleasant than the typical concrete wall that you see. So these examples are familiar to you, but I remind you that they are ways of recategorizing infrastructure as multifunctional and multipurpose. I also um, would suggest that the ideas are, of course, not new. Even as, as early as 1949, the idea of ecology as biogeokinosis, this life and earth functioning together in an infrastructural form, uh, was written about right through the 40s to the 60s. Of course, most of it was in Russian and German and maybe not so politically acceptable at the time to North Americans. And now it's something we see published quite widely. This piece by Christian Levick in 2002. You're perhaps more familiar maybe with uh, the work of Ian McCarg in landscape architecture here in North America. Also um, the Odom brothers, in particular Howard T. Odom is an ecologist who began to think of ecolo ecology in systems terms. So looking at engineering systems and understanding life functioning systems as whole ecologies. So the systems ecology movement that arose in the early 1980s is really where we start to see a major shift in thinking about ecology that gives us real insights into um, infrastructure and design that I'll spend the next um, sort of 20 minutes talking about. These trajectories of thought are important to, and research are important to recall and to highlight along this journey because they remind us that again, these ideas are not new, but they're being recast. They're being recast in an integrated way and in a way that's highly creative, that takes work and research in the sciences and offers room for both conceptual development and speculation and projection in design. And that's, I think, very fertile right at the moment. Fred's, uh, Fritz Steiner's work in particular, The Living Landscape, which I think the first edition came out in the early 1980s, um, or early 1990s, I should say, 1992, I think, 1991, and has now just been, um, the, I don't know which volume this is now, but the, the second or third edition is out now. These all, this kind of thinking about the living layered landscape that takes its departure from the work of Ian McCarg in the 1960s begins to link up with landscape ecology. So at a scale at which we can suddenly see the world differently in the 1980s, because in particular satellite information has been declassified, we can see the world at a totally different scale. So this is the beginning of looking very large scale at movement across landscape to understand, for example, wildlife movements, floral and faunal movements, very large scale. So our ability to understand infrastructural change at a large scale is suddenly present, partly because we have the tools of observation in the 1980s and 1990s. Now, of course, we live in a world of Google Earth, which has completely revolutionized our ability to zoom in and zoom out and to see things at a level of detail we've really not um, done before. But looking at these diagrams, what I hope you take away from them is that this is 25 years old now, these kinds of diagrams that look at movement and flow, which from a landscape architectural and planning perspective are really interesting. This is not something that is, um, has necessarily been taught within the core of planning or even the core of landscape architecture, but it's familiar to us on the periphery and yet offers tremendous insight if we start thinking about landscape and urbanism together the movements and flows of wildlife. So these notational diagrams that come from Richard Foreman's work, for example, in landscape ecology, begin to have more relevance, I think, today as we look at whole cities and the concepts of natural flows and living systems within the city. We see contemporary, uh, lots of contemporary work that takes that uh, research, for example, from landscape ecology, the work of Richard Foreman that I mentioned earlier, 
and others and begins to apply it in a series of habitat matrices or new biotopes for human living that are linked with natural systems. This is the work of Opsis or Pierre Bélanger, also a Harvard colleague, a studio that I did together with Pierre now three years ago uh, that looked at the Dutch Delta. We had 12 students um, reconsidering the poldering system in the Dutch Delta, asking questions about, well, when the 10,000 year flood happens or when the sort of triple threat of downstream uh, floodwaters at the mouth of the Dutch Delta, coupled with the sea level rise, coupled with land subsidence, the Dutch Delta is sinking, means that this country, once again, ha the, the Dutch Delta has to begin to turn to face water in a way that they've you know, really mastered at keeping out. It might mean a very different thing for infrastructure. So our students spent three months thinking about how to re-engage the seacoast in a time of perpetual wet feet or flood coming up with everything from new types of industries that, again, aren't really new, but recast. Different kinds of aquatic farming, different kinds of bivalve industries, um, looking at uh, algae for energy use, for example, some of which I saw today also in the studio. So these types of um, infrastructural diagramming have their roots in a sea change of ideas around ecology. This is Stan Allen's work. Um, this is the Field Conditions Diagrams, 1999, from Points and Lines. And of course, Stan is not an ecologist. Stan is an architect with a deep fascination in ecology. And so even his diagrams and points and lines and the notational diagrams take their roots from ecological flows and form. Our own work, um, my work together with Jim Corner in the Downsview Park competition in 1992, these early diagrams that we did together tend to look like successional diagrams that were researched for habitats native to the area that they were proposed, but they're really more than successional. The problem is representationally they still look quite static, but in 1999, at the time that competition was held, no one had ever really challenged interdisciplinary design teams to think about ecological systems in the city. This was the first time a 30-year project with a timeline, a time scale, um, you know, that was really quite dramatic, 30 years. These kind of process diagrams became well, well used and are familiar to all of you now throughout the 1990s, um, into well through the last decade. So all of these were reflective of the emergence of new models of ecology. New models of ecology that offer us very different ways of understanding how the natural world not only functions in terms of research and practice, but different ways of knowing, thinking about ecology as not a stable state. Living systems are in constant dynamism and flux. We know this intuitively, and you know this intuitively if you, you know, partake in activities in the natural world. You know about forest fires and floods and uh, catastrophic windstorms and catastrophic floods here, the, the flood that comes and fills up the, the wash and then is gone in a matter of hours to days, depending on the weather. So intuitively we know this, but we don't necessarily incorporate this and have not successfully done this in design, really, at least not in built form. We tend to design, we design for the end state, the money shot, the perfect picture. We don't design for flux and constant adaptation and, cha and change. We try that in studios, but we don't very much do it in practice. And so we think about what these new models of ecology might offer us in terms of shifting paradigms and in terms of alternative practices. Some might say not necessarily best practices, but next practices. So what comes next? In the, to uh, quote my friend and colleague, Christina Hill, and hi, who had this conversation about the other day about whether or not sustainability really didn't just mean resilience plus a bad disaster. That's what resilience is, rather. We had to think about sustainability, throw in a bad disaster, and you have the, the conversation that suddenly becomes about resilience. It suddenly comes about what is the best you could do at the moment and what is the next practice. So these new models of ecology really got us thinking collectively about what some of those um, new scenarios might be. Again, these ideas aren't new. They have their roots in the last 30 to 50 years, but we forget that. We are, in a, I think, a wash in a time, particularly in the um, digital deluge, we are a wash in new brands and great ideas that you know, take the form of an internet meme. And yet, they've been around for a long time, so it pays to think back to where we begin to see the roots. Gregory Bateson's Steps to an Ecology of Mind in 1972 is one of the first books that really talks about ecological systems as a metaphor, understanding how people think, states of mind. He was writing about cybernetics and the human environment relationship. Um, in the 1990s, early 1990s, this is 
um, Tillman, Downing, and Neem's uh, textbook, along with Harold Mooney, that talks about biological diversity from a functional perspective. Rather than just talking about it from a structural perspective, they begin to think, what are the functions of diversity? And this is an ecosystem book, uh, one of the first of its kind, I think, that looks synthetically across the biological and zoological systems. Also, um, Steve Hubble's work, 2001, this talks about the unified theory of biodiversity that asks about the um, landscape scale and time scale of biological change that happens through diversity and structure. So in the biological sciences, this is a change that's happening um, that I think has, has um, resonance for landscape architecture today. We don't know so much see at that time, but these are the connections. In a similar wave of attention that was happening in the resource management sciences, in we might say environmental sciences, but really at the time these were called resource management sciences, and largely this came out of Canadian environmental resources and also northwestern, northern United States. So there's a group of researchers that have been around for quite some time in that really have their roots in Minnesota, um, the northern states, and southern Canada, and west coast of Canada. In particular, the two key uh, players are at the University of Minnesota and at the University of British Columbia. They were concerned about managing resources in terms of consumption, and they studied cybernetics, they studied ecological engineering, and they looked very closely at Odom's work in ecosystem sciences. And they began to realize that you could not possibly make sense of human systems of harvesting natural resources without understanding ecological cycles. And this work is derived from 20 years worth of research in self-organizing open systems, understanding how fisheries behave, understanding how forested ecosystems behave. And so a lot of the research that we saw in the 1990s in forest fire management, for example, is touched on in this work in Panarchy. And the model that's on the cover, this figure eight, is called now sort of colloquially referred to as a hauling figure eight or the hauling four box. And what this really is showing is that ecosystems are constantly going through this loop a figure eight loop of birth, growth, death, and renewal. And death is in quotation marks because ecosystems don't really die. They change form and then they reorganize into something that may or may not be recognizable to those who harvest them and who live in them. And so this becomes very important. The takeaway message is that it, this isn't really just about the standard textbook model of succession that says a forest grows up, it becomes more complex in structure, the canopy closes in, the trees become very old, and the idea is it's stable. It stays for a very long time in that condition. And that may be the case to the human eye, but of course, over time, nothing is stable. They're all in conditions of semi-stability, and they are always changing, depending on the scale of observation. So landscape architects, planners, architects, we tend to understand the idea of scale as central to what we do. Depends on the scale of observation, depends on the scale, spatial scale and the time on how we make sense of this. We've seen this image redrawn in numerous uh, incarnations now in landscape architecture as we try to visualize these systems as they go through various permutations. And they're always based on the central idea of resilience. This graphic is meaning what, what the, again, the takeaway or short message of this graphic is that any system has multiple basins or imagine it as a bowl-like condition in which a ball, that is the system in which we're in, moves. And once that shape undulates and moves through a variety of external forces, your system can look very different. The external conditions around you can look very different as the shape changes. So the idea is to be resilient. You want to keep the shape of the, the system in which you're operating and not move to a state that is no longer recognizable. And we know in ecology this happens fairly regularly. And the reason that it's worth emphasizing this is to understand the living system dynamics in which you are currently entrained, whether it's the Sonoran Desert at your doorstep or whether it's the system of water rights and usage around you, all of their, these, these um, systems have multiple states of operation. We all generally tend to prefer one. Um, although there may be many possibilities. And part of our job as designers is to recognize where those alternative states lie and that to understand what the trigger points are to keep that system in a state of conditions that are sustainable or healthy or usable by the inhabitants, for the majority of inhabitants, in a way that we hope re reflects a fair and equitable um, society. In most cases, this is the kind of thing we aspire to. So just as an example, we might think that we might look to um, 
I use the example of the Great Lakes where I live, but I'm sure there is an example for the desert, a desert ecosystem that most of you would be more familiar with. We could think of uh, ecosystems that are forested that in, in certain very wet years become swamp-like and they retain water at, at um, the water table is closer to the surface. And when it drops away, those species change and the forest becomes something else. And in fact, very regularly, it may move between those two conditions depending on the amount of water um, that's present in any, any given year. And generally speaking, the inhabitants of these areas like to keep one of these states. They'd like to do something to encourage it because there's probably resources worth harvesting or there's an economic or recreational amenity value to it. The example of the Great Lakes is that in a pelagic condition, the lake, lakes are inhabited by large sport fish. You can imagine that people generally like large sport fish. When the lakes shift to a benthic condition, which happens fairly regularly through a variety of triggers that are now becoming better known, that system can move to a more benthic oriented system. So more species occur at the bottom in the mud. Less desirable from an economic perspective, less desirable from a wading, bathing, swimming, recreational perspective, you might imagine. So there are preferences for one kind or another. Ecologically, there is no right system. This particular example reflects an idea of movement between normal states, some of which we encourage. And so when we come back to a diagram like this, what that means is that we want to figure out in any system that we map in terms of infrastructure and support and economic benefit, we want to find out, well, how can we keep that system resilient? How can we keep it operating in a state that we recognize and still leave room for some flux and for some change? What are the drivers of that system? So these kinds of images get us to think about how do we see the kind of complexity that we need the number of structures to keep that system operating. And of course, these are questions of science as much as they are questions of design and desire, social desire. So there are lots of examples. I don't have to spend much time on them. I can just uh, point to various other ecosystems where there are irregular shifts between different kinds of states. Um, even in our own high park in Toronto, we know that to maintain the park forest canopy the way it is most enjoyed and valued, we actually need to burn it. This seems like a contradiction in terms, why would anyone burn a public park. Well, in Toronto we do every other second or third year in order to keep the, the mature oak trees at the, in the savanna state that they are because that state is not permanent. It's a dynamic state and over time it will change. If we want to keep it there, we have to push that uh, system and we do so by burning. Again, seems counterintuitive, but that's a practice to maintain that park infrastructure that's valued. Um, lots of diagrams that Chris Reed and I have been pulling together in this current uh, book that is about to be released that talk about multiple system states and what this means for design. How do we start to visualize these systems? And so some of our students have begun to look at successional diagrams to take early notational work of Richard Foreman and landscape ecology and begin to think what habitat changes look like over time. And then to insert infrastructural models to say, how can they be multifunctional so that in different system conditions they can do different things. So in times of disturbance ecology in this work by Gina Wirth, for example, at the GSD, that looks at a former military base that is being recolonized um, as a park system with various forms of habitat that are, that are taking advantage of a, an area that's been highly disturbed. How can that be harvested and used? So and many of these diagrams that I will show through just very, very quickly give you an idea of the complexity of mapping that goes on, of the processes. And again, this will be familiar to many of you who, who are in the practice of understanding these large, complicated projects that many of us, seems to be, many of us seem to be engaged in all of which center around the, uh, the notion of hybridity. Ecologies, plural, that are connected between the urban environment or some other very uh, human-dominated system that, have, that we want to encourage some natural function in. How does that condition of hybridity mean that we manage? And for me, this work tends to focus around what I think of as green infrastructure, infrastructures that have a living component to them that at the same time have some resource or functional use for, for urban life, for human life. They're, they also tend to be productive, productive of some function that humans value. Whether you think about that as agriculture or whether you think about it as economic or energy, I think it's broadly defined. And I come back to some of the, the works with which you may be familiar. Um, the culture of nature, thinking about the culture of nature has been around for a long time. Bill Cronin's book from the 1990s really seeded much of this conversation. So again, these ideas are not new. What we're seeing that's different now is the idea that the, the cultural, natural um, 
domains are not a schism. We no longer think about, at least in the practices of, ecological, of ecologically oriented planning or landscape architecture or design, we don't tend to think of na nature out there somewhere, but rather that there are these elements of hybridity with which we want to work in our designs. And so outside the, the domain, for example, of, of our practices, there are plenty of works that do this already. Biophilia by Edward Wilson, this notion of the lost child in the woods studying nature deficit disorder. There are many, many of these studies outside our practices that point to an increasing sense of um, culture-nature bonds, bonds and benefits, so to speak, that are worthy of exploration. And our diagramming in landscape architecture and architecture tends to focus on this more and more, really since the early part of the last decade. This series of, again, these very complex layered diagrams that emphasize process almost more than they do structure um, are the precursor to some of what we're seeing now. So field operations work for, um, this is their successional and um, uh, resilience diagram for Staten Island uh, Fresh Kills Park, for example. This is Tom Leader's studio, I think. Was he not here speaking recently? I'm not sure if he showed uh, any of this work or not, but early work from Fresh Kills together with Anu Mather and Dilip Dakuna. And this uh, Gross Max for a vertical garden project in London. You can see the complexity embedded in these diagrams, but the attempt, attempt to show process as much as they do function. The new practices that we're seeing that emanate from these diagrams, these understandings and changing ideas around ecology are many. And they're still at their nascent stage, I would say. Many of them still exist at the studio stage, some in practice. So I want to talk about, just in the closing minutes, really highlight several projects, both speculative and built, that begin to tie some of these ideas together about ecologies plural, as medium, as metaphor, and as motif, and also in the context of these practices, what that means. So adaptive design, designing for changing conditions so that the project doesn't take one end state but has multiple opportunities to flex. This lends us to think about design as a more curatorial practice. practice. How do we curate the kind of conditions we want? Many times this means using these multidisciplinary, very complicated teams, some of which is reflected even in the studios I saw today. Seven, eight members from three different schools having to do research in the, the engineering department and in the agricultural school. All of this is a much broader context, of course, for both planning and landscape architecture, where I'm speaking about specifically, as well as the engagement of an eco-regional planning, looking very lar at large scale um, urbanizing landscapes and their social political context. So we don't anymore look within our own lens. We're sometimes, I think, fraught and uh, exhausted by the need to constantly look to more data. And I tend to tell my students now that the work that we're seeing talks about really being literate in other disciplines, but not an expert, being literate enough to know where a defensible point of departure for your project lies, and then working with others to build that case but your project is still ultimately, as a designer, conceptual and then schematic. And it has to have a point of departure that's defensible. But that doesn't mean becoming the expert in 10 other disciplines. It means working, communicating, collaborating with those disciplines, which demands a certain kind of literacy. It means that we're all challenged in that way to think um, broadly across the disciplines. And these texts, um, which point the way in some senses, uh, take that cue. So my own work in the ecosystem approach is undertaken with people in the agricultural sciences and ecological research sciences as much as in resource and design. Um, not research, but resource uh, management and design. In Fritz Steiner's uh, work, Design for a Vulnerable Planet, he's really talking about adaptive design, adapting con to, to conditions that we can't control, but that we can to some extent manage in times of uncertainty and limited predictability. There's still a role for of course, design and management. Some of the diagramming, again, that comes out of this, I've mentioned already, is process-oriented, but with an eye to infrastructure. In this case, process mapping that goes on in a large, aqu complex aquacultural operation. And this work by Kimberly Garza and Sarah, St Sarah Thomas. Same students here looking at a map of the Dutch Delta in which they're mapping it not only ecologically but politically, understanding where the rivers have been given room politically to flood and what the, sort of the politics of flooding as much as the politics of um, understanding the relationship with the water through aquaculture. 
The Great Park Canyon, again, an unrelated diagram on the surface, but actually in terms of what it maps out, a series of habitats that are introduced and work, work with one another along a gradient of water, follow that same line of thinking about multiple states of possibility within um, uh, a diagram. Of course, these are diagrams, not designs. Uh, Chris Reed and Stoss, a diagram for the, the Bass River Park. This is the diagram of flooding, again, very notational. But they, these diagrams find life, oftentimes in competitions. This one, River City Life for the Toronto Waterfront that I had the opportunity to participate in, again, uh, partnered with Stoss for this project. But the emphasis, the reason I show this is the emphasis is on gradient, understanding the gradient of water and understanding how do we work with this, how do we work with the river basin that we have to restructure the, st the structure of the river, the infrastructure of the river, rather than um, anything else. We have to understand how we can form the city around that river infrastructure. So the city takes its cue from the river, not the other way around. And that means understanding gradient and flow of most materials, movement of water, and fish habitat, for example. This diagram by uh, Scott um, Bishop at Stoss really looks at fish habitat as an indicator for how to use the water in order to structure a city around a city and park. Where are the valuable resources? Where are the interesting resources? Where are the recreational opportunities? Taking a cue from, for example, spatial gradient where fish are concerned. Or um, in the, the river mouth, understanding that the dock walls can be softened, how to use them to create habitat, and at the same time, recreational amenities. In this diagram, looking at water movement across a new mouth for the river, the city taking its cue from the river, again, not the reverse. And some of the more speculative images that, again, projective. They ask us to rethink the relationship with water in the city in this particular one. Some of Jane Wolfe's work, I think, is well worth mentioning in this. Jane Wolfe and her Gutter to Gulf studio at the University of Toronto. I'm working in that studio right now, along with Elise Shelley and Jane Wolfe, two colleagues who have done a wonderful job, I think, of communicating through design the legibility of water infrastructure in New Orleans. Surely a, a, a tall task. Gutter to Gulf is a website, you can look at, at this project yourself at uh, guttertogulf.com, that asks these core questions. Why is New Orleans sinking? Why does the city fight gravity? Why do wetlands matter and what can you do? So very simple questions about what is the least you can do in this very complicated system of water management in a city that it is literally sinking. And through the design work, these students have mapped, done something that I think no one else has done, which is to map the entire piping system, pipes at the smallest level to the very largest level, which believe it or not have never been mapped because they're managed by three different agencies. And so the students over six years have compiled a series of data that look at the water infrastructure that is invisible below the surface and at the surface to help the everyday citizen understand when a drop of water falls, where does it go? What is the effect on people in, in New Orleans? So this is a very real project about understanding a dynamic system with multiple states of operation through the design lens, through making something legible, more than just mapping, because of course this comes to bear on um, property management, on individuals' ability to manage their property. And of course this, the emphasis in this project is understanding that New Orleans is part of a much larger uh, basin, that of the entire continent. It really affects uh, water in New Orleans. So it's not only a local and a regional problem, but a continental problem. And so scale becomes quite important. This project um, is at the other end of the Mississippi, Streamlines. This is the Riverfront uh, Park Design Competition for uh, Minneapolis, Minneapolis. And the, look here, the park here, this is also an entry with uh, Chris Reed and Stoss. This is, a, again, a project that un asks really an interrogative question. What is the relationship with water? And how might it be fundamentally different in a city that is changing very quickly in an area that is deindustrialized and reintroducing uh, a water's edge that is accessible. So what might that look like in a time where our park systems look and feel very different than they did uh, many years ago? The re reintroduction of contemporary programs, but also with industry, in this case with waste to energy and with heated geothermal. Um, so, so some very, some images that still tend to show a, a, a single state, but when you looked at in, in a series, try to show some ephemerality and change over seasonality and so on. The last project I'll emphasize is one that um, some of you may know. This is the ARC International Design Competition. This is not it, but we took some inspiration from this bridge uh, project that was done in tandem with Maya Lin. Uh, 
uh, some years ago in Seattle, a pedestrian bridge. But we asked the question in this competition, how to move everyone safely where they have to go? Uh, this was the first time that a uh, competition has been held to move animals safely across a road and to bring people safely to their destination. Because of course, when people and animals intersect in this condition, uh, the result can be dramatic. And it's not just a, a northwest problem, and it's not just a southeast problem, it's an everywhere problem. These images, of course, are mostly taken from the, set, the north and the west, since that's the area that we were working in. Um, but the tragic part about these, these questions are that they have a problem for humans as much as they do for animals. Some of these are more tragic in this case for this particular creature. This might be a solution. We know th that the science is actually strong and conclusive, robust ecological science on how animals move. The science of road ecology is fairly conclusive that when these kinds of structures are built in the right spot, when infrastructure of this kind is put in the right spot, meaning that we know where vehicle wildlife collisions occur, we know where human fatalities and animal fatalities uh, coalesce, we know when particular kinds of species are moving across the road, and when we use those data to inform a design decision, we know that these structures, when combined with fencing, exclusionary fencing on either side of the road, we know that they work close to 100%. Their success rate is They've, pr they've solved the problem. So there's no real outlying question of science here other than questions of genetic flow and whether or not they connect uh, genetically in the, in the way that we hope they do. That research is coming. A recent paper published in Nature two weeks ago indicates that grizzly bear success in terms of mating and breeding and diversification, 27% success in the first 10 years of, of, of this particular site. So there is some research uh, happening in that regard too. But we know that they work safely. So here is an example of green infrastructure combined with um, a transit planning connection that we know works. The design competition, for those of you who are interested, I will conclude with this, uh, was held in Colorado over the I-70 for reasons that relate to uh, the location. It was a high impact area, so to speak, in terms of the ecological viability. It's a very important area for species migration and species movement. It's also a very high profile area and a very congested area on the I-70 just out between Denver and Vail. And the competition site was at East Vail Pass, West Vail Pass rather, it's been relocated to the east. And this competition was interesting for a number of different reasons, but not least of which it captured the attention of the media very broadly. So when a bridge for bears you know, makes the New York Times, you know that people are listening. There's an interesting conversation afoot about, well, what does it mean to move everyone safely, to move animals and people safely, oftentimes in areas in, in different directions, you know, in, in, um, in opposing directions. So the fact that you know, Fast Company thought that a simple concrete bridge was interesting tells us that there's a communication happening around this problem that resonates for people. Uh, roadkill is a problem for everyone. Uh, the Harvard Gazette covered this, and even the Science uh, Journal. So we were very pleased that we took research in ecological science and moved it out to a much broader medium of communication. I don't need to spend too much time on the project other than to say, for me, what is successful about this project was that five finalist teams showed us five very different ways to think about infrastructure on a roadway that used new materials, new methods, and new thinking about moving people and animals safely. This particular example by Janet Rosenberg and Associates is one that suggests multiple clientele. So here you have a bridge that is red and iconic to the human eye, but unremarkable to the animal client. Um, so just one way of thinking about multiple ecologies on the site. So a bridge that doesn't have to be a simple um, civil engineered structure, not to say that civil engineering is reduced to being simple, but rather that it has much greater opportunity when taken from one discipline to many. So architects, landscape architects, ecologists, artists, thinking about this problem as multimodal and multifunctional resonates for us. The winning um, project, uh, this particular example, not the winning project, but also a, a contender and the finalists from the Dutch team, uh, really thought about using an everyday material, concrete. In this case, thin shell concrete, um, that was used to span uh, quite a large distance, including an observatory platform. But the winning project by HNTB and, and Michael van Valkenburg, Ted Zoli being the engineer, and uh, Robert Rock from MVVA, this project is interesting because it challenges the idea of the bridge. You know, is this a landscape? 
Is it a bridge? Is it a tunnel? And the answer is it is all of those. It is a new landscape. It's a reconnecting landscape the size of several you know, football fields, potentially, or can be scaled right down because of the way in which it's conceived using a high power vault. It can have multiple uh, types of ecology, so ecological habitat across the surface. But because of the way that it is um, modular, using this one module, the hyper vault module, can be created almost like Lego. Um, that's really a very simplistic analogy, but snapped together um, while the highway maintains operation in terms of the way they, they conceive the design. So this was a project that resonated for our jury because it used an everyday material in an unconventional way. And it did so by repurposing and adapting that material in a modular and adaptive way. So this was something that was a relatively new way of thinking about a simple crossing um, that is currently being considered for installation in, in several different sites, I'm happy to say. If you're interested in this work, please have a look at our um, ongoing sort of data clearinghouse and communication site at arc solutions.org where you'll see lots of progress and research, particularly in that it links together the sciences of road ecology with infrastructure, I think in a very contemporary way. We also asked um, the design teams here to consider how these structures would learn. How could they learn and how could they teach? And so we saw some attempts by several of the teams to use the wildlife observation cameras, the scientific monitoring equipment in a way that makes it accessible and communicative to the public. So what is currently a billboard on I-70 might, we hope, become a handheld application that allows people and passers-by at fast speed to understand what is happening in the landscape around them at a different scale. Uh, we've worked in this project in a number of different milieu, and I'll close by saying that, you know, we've been able to tell this story through the medium of film and video and science, as well as an artistic exhibit. In this case, one of our collaborators, Le Leanne Allison, has made a film that is related to the movement of wildlife in Banff National Park called Bear 71. You can look it up. It's very easy to find. It's easy to access. And this film caught the attention of Robert Redford at the Sundance um, film festival, and again, this tells us that these are contemporary issues. They are not confined to um, obscure disciplines, but they are the language of every day. We have taken this work out in a more broad and public way in terms of an exhibit called Crossing Reconnecting Landscapes, which opened at the Evergreen Brickworks in Toronto and will soon move to Calgary, that asks people to reconceive the urban landscape, the hybridity and the conditions that allow people to literally rethink the physical space they're in, as well as the ecologies that sustain us in the uh, growing urban condition. If you're interested in this work and um, the kinds of ways of represent re representation that happen in landscape, ecology, and urbanism, please, I hope you will um, be able to follow some of that through projective ecologies. And do, please, um, engage in that work by putting the work of your studios out for public consumption, because I promise you there is an appetite well beyond your discipline. Thank you so very much for your patience and your attention.